Good afternoon. I see that we're all suffering from lunch, uh, but thank you for those of you that are here. Um, really what I want to talk to you today about is the future of cryptography. And I believe that that future is very much affected by the things that are quantum. And what I'd like to tell you is that I have a very simple mission when it comes to what I'm supposed to do at KPN. I'm supposed to keep KPN, her customers, our data, reliable, secure, and trusted for those customers, but also for our partners and for society as a whole, since we are the critical infrastructure provider and the incumbent operator in the Netherlands. So let's take a look at what the actual problem is, and then we're gonna take a look at what we're gonna actually do about it. So I'm gonna try to cover this in 20 minutes, so please bear with me, and I'll try to speak as slowly as possible. The threat is very simple. We've known that since 2011, that intelligence agencies pretty much have an entire dossier about us. They know who we speak to, where we are, how we congregate. They can build a dossier on our digital lives. And that means that these agencies, while they possess this enormous power in their information awareness, are afraid of one thing. They're afraid of cryptography because they call it the going dark problems. There are areas which they cannot penetrate because people are using strong cryptography to basically secure their private data. And even though we've seen through the Snowden revelations just how all-encompassing this power of the intel agencies is, and it's only growing every day, there's still lack of public opinion or any form of real, true public outrage. And you see that there's not that consistent. So take a look at the John Oliver video, just Google John Oliver and Snowden, and you'll see that actually during a Vox Populi, people don't know what to think about mass surveillance unless it affects them very clearly and directly. And fundamentally, for those of you that are a bit older, you'll have heard of the original crypto wars, where we were actually trying to fight to prevent cryptography from being broken, weakened, or having back doors or front doors, for that matter, placed in them. And what we see now is that we're going back to that war that we originally had in the 1990s, which we won, by the way, for the security community, and we're going back there. It's being challenged again. There is still not consistency across the EU member states, for example, what to do about Backdoors. If you take a look at the cabinet position of the country of the Netherlands, they've been very clear. We don't want backdoors in encryption because we don't want to weaken our actual operational capability to keep our secrets secret. But it goes further than that, of course. It goes to the capability of intel agencies and law enforcement to penetrate other targets. And you see that the NSA shares this problem. They actually have something that's called a black budget for quantum research. Black budget is a budget that they don't have to officially declare or openly justify. It came out of part of the Snowden documents. They have two programs uh, which are falling under this budget. One of them is called Penetrating tar Targets. So that's actually a program to break the strong cryptography that's being used. Um, and the second one is called Owning the Net, which is part of a, a much larger program to uh, make sure that they have compromised capabilities intact. So if that's the threat, if that's what there is to worry about, what could the potential solutions be and why are we talking, especially in the EU, about quantum as a solution? Let's first talk about what quantum is so that we have a common level of understanding. And again, I appreciate that this is after lunch, so bear with me. If you take a look at classical physics, there's a couple of characteristics. You know, it was before 1900, it talks about big stuff, the macroscopic world. It's deterministic, which means if we know uh, A, then we know B uh, in, in an equation-like form, and it's highly intuitive. When we take a look at quantum physics, which has really developed, you know, the 1920s, uh, or not really developed, but it was discussed at the 1920 Solvay conference with Einstein and Niels Bohr, then we're talking about the microscopic world. We're talking about highly probabilistic outcomes. So probability is the name of the game. The very central role of the observer, so you have to actually observe the phenomenon. In order to do that, you have certain conditions that need to exist, and it's not very intuitive. In fact, it's very often counterintuitive to what we know uh, from our experience in classical physics. The question you need to ask I think is when will the post-quantum era arrive? And if we can define that, a post-quantum era is an era where we have quantum computers. 
Can I just ask, because it's a very brave crowd that's here today, how many of you have heard about the developments of quantum computing? There's one per, two, okay, two, yay, three maybe. Yeah, okay, there's a few people, thank you. Um, but let's talk about what the properties are of a quantum computer and why it's cool. Because if we take a look at current computers, they use zeros and ones. A zero or a one, that's a traditional bit. However, a quantum computer uses something that's called a qubit, which is already interesting because it means that it can be the zero and the one at the same time. So you've already increased your computational capability. However, if you add this principle from quantum physics called entanglement to the mix, you've exponentially increased your computing power because now you don't just have it as a zero and a one at the same time for a single qubit. You can entangle those qubits and they have such a relationship with one another that you can actually, instead of having the zero or the one, you have the zero or the one and the zero and the one and you can keep entangling the qubits together to create a very large array of qubits which you can work with. And it's those relationships that give your quantum computer scale and power. Einstein didn't like this principle of entanglement. He actually called it spooky action at a distance. And we always tried to explain it away. One of the tests in order to prove entanglement is called the Bell test. And the Bell test previously was always created with loopholes in it. By the way, I get that this is difficult stuff for people who are in information security and computer science. The reason I'm here explaining it to you is that you need to understand this because this is gonna change the face of our industry if you don't. So let's be very clear. This loophole-free Bell test, what it does is it actually proves beyond doubt the fact that we do have entanglement occurring. What you see on the screen are two diamonds at a distance of about four kilometers. There's a signal sent in either direction simultaneously. And what you see is by because these two bits are entangled, that a message sent here that alters this bit will also alter he over here. It proves the principle of entanglement, even when separated a very large distance of four kilometers. So the fact is we can prove entanglement now and that it works. It's part of the characteristic that's fundamental in order to create a quantum computer. What their other characteristics are of a quantum state is quantum computers are finicky beasts. They have this principle of fragility, which means that the states that exist between these qubits is highly sensitive and fragile. If there is an observation or noise or jitter, it can actually break this quantum state. The other principle is that there's a, it's a good thing, the fact is that there's a no cloning principle. You can't well, like, do what you could do in regular computing. You can just make a copy of your information. You cannot do this in quantum because if you try to copy that information, you will change it. It's a fundamental principle by observation or trying to copy or clone, it will not work. You will alter the particles that you're trying to observe. When you actually build a quantum computer, we should know that there's more than one type of quantum computer. There's a quantum annealer, which is a kind of common or device, an easier to build device. And this is, if you've ever heard of D-Wave, the type of quantum computer that they're building. Then you'll have another type of quantum computer called an analog quantum computer. And this is probably what's gonna happen in the very near to recent future. And finally, you have the universal quantum computer. This is the holy grail. This is what everyone's trying to build. We expect that this will be there between, you know, 2030-ish, so anywhere a little bit before or a little bit after there, but we think that it'll be there for public knowledge and commercial use. What does it all mean, all this quantum stuff? Everybody here who uses cryptography that's asymmetric, raise their hand. So if you use RSA, elliptic curve, DSS, raise your hand if you use that cryptography. Is there anyone who doesn't use asymmetric cryptography? Okay, well it should be all of you, because we all do every day for everything, every banking transaction, every social integration, anything that you use cryptography over the net, the majority of those things are asymmetrically based. The clue is the quantum computer is going to break all of that asymmetric crypto that you use. This is because of the fact that a regular computer, 
a regular normal computer that we know today, it suffers from something called Amdahl's law, which means you can't keep adding processors and expecting an exponential increase in processing power and speed. It actually you know, over, over the amount of process you, you add actually decreases. However, this is not true for a quantum computer. You're actually exponentially increasing your processing capability, especially for complex problems. When we talk about asymmetric cryptography, it's based on the fact that we have difficult computational problems to solve. You know, it's the multiplication of two large primes or other computational challenges. This is only a challenge for our current computers. This is not a challenge for a quantum computer. When you have the viable amount of qubits that are also then entangled, and you have that exponential speed up in your computation capacity, you're talking about a massive game changer. What are those game changers based on? Well, they're based on two algorithms. The first of those algorithms is called SHOR, which allows you to do integer factorization, so you're multiplying two large primes. If you factor for one of those primes, you've basically got enough information to derive the key. The other is Grover's. Grover's allows you to look through an unsorted database. You know, Grover's is a slow algorithm, but it'll work in order to help the speed up that's already being done by Shore. There's also other cool stuff you can do with a quantum computer. I mean, we can uh, figure out time problems. We can do all kinds of very cool things with quantum. We can do simulation of natural systems, there, because the idea is every single qubit, you can actually write values there. And because you're entangling those qubits, you can actually solve complex problems with multiple factors in it. So the, the clue is, guys, we're all trying to build a quantum computer. We're also all trying to figure out how to do when there is one. And if you take a look at the EU, there is an EU flagship program which is pledged 1 billion euros. How many EU programs do you know that has a billion euros? Okay. So we've got a flagship EU program to help with all things quantum. This is a significant thing. So there is an organizational impetus, there's a carrot here for companies to innovate, but there's a huge carrot here when you look at what state governments, intelligence agencies, and law enforcement will also be doing to try to get a quantum computer capability. And when they get it, they will not tell you, and they will also not tell each other. Because what would be the ideal situation is to collect all of the traffic that's being sent now, which is not quantum safe collect everything and decrypt it later when you've got one. This is gonna be the equivalent of having the next nuclear weapon, but a nuclear weapon in secret. Think about the advantages there. How many computer science professionals do you know that are worried about quantum? How many information security people do you know that are looking at the challenges to this type of cryptographic weakening? The clue is you should because we're not there yet, but we're going to be pretty soon. If you take a look, what it's about is, you know, if we want to factor RSA, what's the factoring time, how many qubits would you need, and how long is it going to take? The more qubits you have, the exponential decrease in time that you would need in order to conduct factoring. Take a look at the press release only issued a few days ago that D-Wave is already now at 2,000 qubits. Still not enough, we still want more, but this is a commercial company that has already sold its quantum computer to Google. It's also sold it to the US government. Everybody's playing and experimenting. How far are you in the country and geography that you're from to do the same thing? And then, when we have this challenge, what do we do? I think it actually requires a sort of three-step plan when there is this new nuclear type capability with the quantum computer that we first need to look at, okay, we all use cryptography today. We need to first of all lengthen the current key length that we use for our current crypto. This is also following the advice of the NSA, by the way. Then we need to investigate places because it's not available everywhere, and there are lots of limitations with it, but you need to look for where you can use quantum key distribution for high critical links for demands of long-term secrecy. So that means you can use it now for protecting the things that you're gonna worry about later when the quantum computer is already there. And you should also look at post-quantum cryptographic algorithms. This is also part of the EU flagship program. This is also part of Horizon 2020, but we should be looking at new algorithms that we can use 
that will actually be available to uh, prevent against a new quantum attack. That key length advice, I wasn't joking, it's coming directly from the NSA, but the NSA already started this, device, this advice last year. So they already have a catch up on you. They've already recommended using quantum resistant algorithms. Just Google NSA B suite. If you take a look at how quantum key distribution works, Alice wants to talk to Bob. However, instead of just talking to him regularly, she's gonna use a quantum channel between Alice and Bob. If Eve tries to disrupt the quantum channel in between, you're gonna know about it because of the principles of quantum. No cloning. So she can't try to copy or observe the traffic without being observed herself. So Alice and Bob are gonna know that Eve is there because she's trying to touch that link. When you take a look how it really works, there are basically equipment on both sides, at Alice, at Bob's. They are polarized in a particular way, so when there is a photon source or a light source going through the polarized filter, it'll be orienting the photons in a particular way. Bob knows how the polarizers are set up. He's gonna have it ready to be able to detect it on his side, and then he's gonna be able to read whatever Alice sent him. Eve has no clue. Eve is gonna try to read these, these photons, and she's gonna screw up with because she's gonna change them. So the photon that Alice sent will no longer be what Bob receives, which means it'll break on Bob's side and he'll know that Eve was there. This is not an easy idea, but I hope it's clear. There have been experiments in the EU on using things like free space quantum because quantum has a limitation because of the fact that you're doing it over a fiber optic cable. Fiber optic cable without repeaters can only be extended to 64 kilometers. It's a short distance. So free space quantum means that you can extend beyond 64 kilometers to a space of 144 kilometers to have a quantum link, but for example, in the islands of the Canary Islands between Las Palmas and Tenerife, 144. That's pretty cool. We also see that there are global developments. I'm very much in admiration of what's happening in China right now. They're building an entire quantum backbone of 2,000 kilometers and it's going to connect all of these cities together with an entire quantum network. So you'll have a super secure network and all the data that's transmitted on it will not be subject to interception by whomever. We are nowhere near there in the EU. Post-quantum cryptography is the name of the game. I think this is the most future-proof solution that we should be investing in, and that's all about getting new cryptographic algorithms in place. We already had Macalise, which is lattice-based cryptography since 1978, but what we need to do is take a look at advancements on PQ Crypto, which uh, you might know Tanya Lange from Elliptic Curve, uh, and there are also advances. I won't try to kill your brain with the uh, super singular isogeny stuff, but this is the future of cryptography. The clue, remember again, we got to start today with some of this because everything you're transmitting now is just being collected for later decryption. One of the things that KPN has done is done just a toe dip in the water. We did a test looking at quantum key distribution. We're also you know, actually asking for everything that we use to have an increased key length, but we've done one quantum key distribution link with ID Quantique between two of our data centers in The Hague and Rotterdam. Just to finish up this 20 minute very heavy talk, I hope you can digest this after lunch, we're just getting started. If you have time, Google the public accessible quantum computer that IBM has said about. It only has five qubits. You know, it's only five, but here's the thing, it's the real deal. And we don't even know correctly how to use that quantum computer to its maximum efficiency and capability. So we are so just getting started. The whole area of quantum software is just as interesting. Google has pledged to have a quantum supremacy experiment of having 50 qubits within one year. This was announced in May of last year. So we should also be following the stuff that Google does here. I also told you they also have D-Wave computer, but they're working on their own quantum computer next to it. What we need, however, and that's why all of you are here and I'm gonna ask, we need a common way forward. Right now, we still have fights between cryptographers and information security professionals and physicists. This is ridiculous. We need a way out of this mess together and we need to recognize that we need as an information security community to understand the physicist because if we don't take the time to do that now, it'll be to our very sorry surprise later. 
We also need thought leadership and action. We need people to actually take efforts to do something about the problem, work together, work on subsidies, find academics, and really engage the community to provide new solutions. And we need to look at different options for combining defense on depth. You know, like we always used to do in information security, we need that here as well. What I am asking is a call for action amongst our community. The fact is most of the people that are working in information security today are not even aware of the problem. We need to first overcome that hurdle in order to do something about it. Please go ahead and talk to your teams and your colleagues and let them know they need to be ready. Thank you.